still you. Now, I do have a question in, in terms of, I'm not sure how to call it actually, but I do have a, a laptop at home with Apple, or a mobile with Apple. And I've noticed that Apple is eating. Yeah. <laughs> Could you please tell me what it means in terms of science and in terms of ethics and morality? Thank you. <laughs> um, I have more than once made a joke about the Apple's logo. It's eaten. And um, I'll be honest with you, I don't understand and, and I don't know the history of the Apple company, Steve Jobs. By the way, Steve Jobs was Syrian. His original name is Estefan Ayub. He's anglicised it to Stephen Jobs. Yub is how we say Job. So Ayub in Arabic is actually Arabic for Job, the figure in the Old Testament. Um, but I'm going to be very honest here, I can't pretend that I know about the origins of the logo, why Steve Jobs chose that for his company, why he named it Apple. But I have thought about it as a joke because it looks like the symbol for original sin. Um, now in the original sin, it wasn't an apple as such, the data in scripture doesn't say it was an apple, it says it was a fruit. We presume it was an apple. What's important here is to understand the nature of original sin and the original sin was um, basically our original parents and I do believe in an Adam and Eve historically as individuals okay because humans are spiritual beings and, the, and our soul is a spiritual soul and that's not a product of uh, evolution because evolution and even the evolutionists tell you only only pertains to material bodies material beings and most evolutionists don't believe in a soul in any case, but um, the original sin was basically our original parents accepting a lie. The lie that God was a liar and that if they ate the fruit they would not die. And in fact, not that they would not only not die, but they would become like God in knowledge, knowing good and evil. And that's an undercurrent of the modern movement of Luciferianism that I mentioned in the men's talk. Luciferianism is not necessarily the worship of Lucifer. It's not Satanism in the sense of worshipping Satan. It's actually a philosophy which says that we can attain enlightenment and a greatness in this world through knowledge. It's a form of Gnosticism, salvation through knowledge. And so the original sin was an act of disobedience uh, born out of a pride that was ignited by a lie. Okay, and hence we will have all the consequences have flowed to Adam and Eve and to their, their subsequent generations through natural generation. We are all beings that have inherited the consequences of original sin through natural generation. Hence, we all need a saviour. Hence, Jesus Christ, the new Adam, is saviour of the whole world. So it's all connected. And I'll just finish on this point. The one big problem with education, and I, I'm involved in education, and one huge problem with education, Catholic education, in recent decades, I'd say at least 50 years, was the denial of Adam and Eve as individuals and original sin as a reality that occurred as, a, as, an, as an historical event that impacted on them and all subsequent generations. Because if we don't believe in original sin, then why do we need a saviour? And if we don't need a saviour, what's Jesus doing on the cross? And if Jesus is wasting his time on the cross, he becomes that Beatles song. Who's heard of the Beatles? You all have. Who's ever heard of the song, Fool on the Hill? The Beatles song, Fool on the Hill. Okay, yeah. All right, a few nods. If you listen to that song, it's a very enchanting melody. And the Fool on the Hill is Jesus Christ. If there's no original sin, what's he dying for? Okay. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Yeah, can I add some more teeth to your question? Like he actually goes in and there's a couple occasions where it's told that God says, go wipe out everyone. Like that's, there's, no, it's not, that only happens a couple times, but that's, that's even more intense. Like it's one thing to go defend your nation and all you can understand that, but why would God go in and say, go take this city and destroy everything? And so I'm glad for that very light question on a Saturday afternoon, uh, which I actually would argue is I think one of the most difficult questions in, when it comes to, to the Bible. So I won't pretend to offer a full-blown answer here briefly, but I, I'll say a couple things here. First of all, it is only on a couple circumstances. Secondly, we have to read these in light of the wider context of salvation history in which God says, Jesus says in the New Testament that there were some, that like God gave, or Moses gave some laws that were not good. So I want to remember that. And it doesn't mean that the laws were wicked and evil, it's just that they weren't part of the larger plan God wanted to do. For example, divorce. Divorce is evil. God hates divorce, the Old Testament says. God can work with divorced couples and bring mercy and healing and compassion, all that, yes, but God does not want divorce. And yet, Jesus says, in the beginning it was not so. So there was a law in the Old Testament that allowed for divorce, but that wasn't what God was planning. It's the law that comes due to the hardness of the hearts of the people. And so God's original plan is the two will become one flesh, but over time, the people's hard-heartedness, people would get divorced, particularly men would divorce, and then they'd marry someone else, and then divorce and marry someone else. And to try to mitigate the, the, the impact of multiple divorces, there was a, a certain law given in Deuteronomy to try to minimize that, that allowed for divorce, but it wasn't because God wanted divorce, it was he just didn't want it to get out of hand, and, and he knew that he wasn't gonna be able to get rid of divorce altogether at this point without grace and without the sacraments, etc. That's just one example of a law that was given because of the hardness of the hearts. Ezekiel chapter 20, even in the Old Testament, before Jesus recognizes that God gave them laws that were not good. And that's what he's referring to. It's just sometimes like when you have a child that's really wayward and, 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 and going off the rails, you might not want him to do this. You'd rather have him live virtuously up here, but you realize he's just not capable of that at all. So I've got to come down and meet him down here and I may, I just tolerate certain things that I'm not excited about, but it's to try to mitigate it from getting even worse. Does that make sense? I think God's a wise father, and that's what the church fathers saw, that the father would come down, condescend, and meet the people where they're at, and give them laws that they needed at that time, but that wasn't necessarily the plan for overall. I think that's just important to realize about a whole set of things in the Old Testament, but that's the context from which I would then address the question, why is it that he says go into the town of Ai, and then wipe everything out, and there is the ban. A few things I would say about those couple occasions where there was that, um, that, that kind of call. One is that way back in the time of the Exodus, right after they crossed the Red Sea, God told Moses to lead the people all the way to the Promised Land. The plan was not to go wander around for 40 years. That was not the original intention. Uh, that right away, that's explicit in the book of Exodus a couple of times, it's very clear. They're supposed to go all the way to the promised land. And they're supposed to go, and they're go going to go, and they're supposed to trust that God is going to be able to make it easy for them to get into the land. Because of their hard-heartedness, they fell into idolatry and worshiped the golden calf. And even after that, they still doubted that they could actually get into the land. They were worried that they were gonna be pounced on by the, the, the pagans that were living in the land. And so they don't go in and then they're punished and they have to wait 40 years because of their hard heartedness. Now, 40 years later, these nations have built up larger armies, larger fortifications. And so now it's gonna be more difficult for them to get the land that God wanted them to have. I'm not saying this answers everything, but I want us to see part <laughs> of the reason God is saying you're gonna have to wipe everything out has to do with their, their lack of faith early on. That's one little piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle is that God also knows that as they're interacting with the pagan nations, even before they get to the promised land, they fall for their pagan women and fall into their pagan lifestyles and that pagan idolatry. That happened at the golden calf, but it, it, it particularly happens in Numbers chapter 25, 
as they're about to go in the land 40 years later, they start falling in love with the Moabite women, having sexual relations with the Moabite women right there in front of the, the, the temple sanctuary, or the, the, the tent sanctuary, and they start worshiping the God of Baal. God knows how weak they are. He knows how weak that when they interact with the pagans like this, they're going to, to be compromised in their faith. And I think that that's part of the reason why God says in certain circumstances, we need to wipe everything out here because Israel is the source that God wants to use to bring blessing to all of the pagan nations. But if because of their weakness and because of the people's sinfulness in the land, they're not gonna be able to do this. And so God has, he lowers and condescends down. It wasn't his original plan. Originally they were supposed to go into land and they were gonna be able to easily take it. it there wasn't a necessity to wipe everything out, but because of the Israelites' hard-heartedness, now we have to have this compromise law. And the similar thing, because of the pagan corruption so much and their influence on the Israelites, there was this case in which this happened. I don't think that that answers everything. I wanna be clear, even in what I'm saying here, I go, well, I still have a couple objections if I was on the atheist side and had to make an argument, but I, I, at least it gives an initial framework for those kinds of conversations. And if we had a whole long semester class, when I teach Pentateuch, we delve into this, but it takes about three hours to walk through all those passages. So I won't bore you with that. Question for either of you, both of you. Um, yesterday, Robert, in your talk, you mentioned the Court of Holiness toward the end of your talk. Again, you um, mentioned a few of the positive aspects of today. Um, so I also you talk today about truth with love, which is a phrase that I've heard time and time again. I mean, you're in a room full of Croatians. We're fairly quite headed and hard headed, or hot blooded and hard headed. So we don't. We're not afraid of an argument. Um, how do we approach these arguments today? So I guess it's a question, a tips and tricks type question. Mm -hmm. How do we approach people we love rather than just bearing the cause of their life? I uh, have made every mistake you can make in apologetics. <laughs> Um, I got involved in apologetics probably from 1979 onwards when I was invited to go to the Billy Graham crusade at Randy Gray's course in May 79 and I got involved with the local Baptist church at Punchbowl. It was the Baptist, I had friends there, my, my friend's name was Stephen and um, he invited me and I went and I had a great conversion experience and then I hung out with Baptists Interschool Christian Fellowship at school, at lunchtime Bible study groups, and then at Sydney Law School at the Evangelical Union. And that was about a six year period. When I came to realise that the Catholic faith was the fullness of truth, and this was early 1986, so nearly seven years later, I went on a really radical bent, very hardline pro Catholic bent, and I became very hostile to Protestantism, probably because I inherited two streams of mentality, the hostile Protestant mentality towards Catholicism. And I got involved with very hardline traditionalist Catholic groups and that reinforced my mentality. I got into a lot of arguments in this period, 1986 to 2002. Debates one-on-one -on -one in homes elsewhere. There was one thing in common with all those debates, the outcome, they were totally fruitless. Not one conversion, not one. Hmm. I used to measure success by coming home and thinking, you know, that after that three or four hours of debate, I clobbered that person. I answered all their questions, they couldn't answer mine. I won the argument. <clears throat> the fundamental mistake I was making is that I lost the person. And probably in many occasions, I reinforced them in their, their, their own particular brand of Christianity because they saw me as obnoxious and, argue, and abusive and, and haughty and why would they want to become Catholic? Things changed slowly from 2002 onwards when I was invited to help found the University of Sydney Catholic Chaplaincy by Archbishop Pell as he was then. And then he gave me the instructions, two instructions. He said, I want apologetics, that made me happy. And then he said, I want you to be friends with the Anglicans. And I went, oh, okay, <laughs> all right. But that was a great thing because I really learned to have conversations with non-Catholics. And 
Uh, so now I'm not arguing with them. Um, we're having coffee over, we're having conversations over coffee. We're talking, we're respecting each other. We're not talking over each other. We're listening to each other's arguments, which are framed in the context now of friendship and trust. And I think that's where the Holy Spirit can work in that context. Holy Spirit cannot work where you're engaging in raised voices, insults, name calling, disrespect, talking over each other and point scoring. No conversions ever happened with me before 2002. Since 2002, I've been an instrument, a secondary instrument, because it's God who converts, the Holy Spirit who converts. We're just instrument. I've been involved in probably nearly a dozen conversions because they can only happen with when people are respected and they're treated like friends and there's trust. Okay, so if you're going to have a debate, oh look, I'm like you, I'm, I'm Lebanese background, so we're just similar to you. We have a similar history with the Turks and attempted and religious civil wars and attempted a, oppression of our nation by other nearby neighbours. We've got a very similar history and we fought for our faith and we're hot-blooded and we will continue to fight for our faith. But really, if you're going to have a debate, you want to have a conversation, make it a conversation in friendship. That's where the Holy Spirit could work. Uh, thank you, Robert. I think uh, just learning from your own experience and sharing that with others is, is, is really helpful. And same thing, there's many times in my youthful zeal, I was all about, okay, I learned these six points from Scott Hahn, and I'm going to really use them. <laughs> uh, and, and I end up wiping people out. And I think you know, learning that it's not about winning arguments, it's really about winning souls. And many times that art of winning the soul the arguments can be really helpful. So you need to know your apologetics. You need to have that in your toolkit. But really, you're reading the person. You're loving the person. You're meeting the person where they're at and how important that is. You may be talking about these issues up here, but you need to be aware of all these other issues that have nothing to do with the Bible. And like, in other words, I can be talking to my Protestant friend, and I can say, well, here's John 6, and here's Matthew 16. I'm proving the papacy, proving the Eucharist. But the real issue is his wife is the daughter of an evangelical pastor, and he's going to wonder what's going to happen with my marriage, what's going to happen with my kids, and I, I need to know these arguments about the Eucharist and the papacy because that's going to help solidify his understanding of the Catholic faith, but he just might need encouragement or guidance and support on what is this going to mean as his life's about to turn upside down. His wife might leave him. I mean, there's a, these are a lot of real personal issues, but if I'm just thinking win argument, win argument, I'm not really addressing the person right in front of me. Another point I would just add on is that I mentioned here is the, um, where they need to feel also that you really respect them, you know, and, and that there's a real kindness in that. I, I, just, I shared the story with some of the, uh, the, the college, university students up in the, at the retreat early this morning, but I remember I was flying back from the East Coast for a, uh, from a speaking event and I was really busy grading papers that were due when, when I got back. And there was a woman next to me and she would every once in a while like just ask a question about Denver or what time we're getting there. And I would be like short answers and just really focused on my paper. And then she asked me, oh, so do you live in Denver? I said, yes. I, uh, my family's there. Oh, yeah. And I tell her about my kids and all. And I, and I said, oh, are you married? And she says, uh, uh, well, my partner and I, and I didn't even realize I'm sitting next to a lesbian couple. And I don't normally get those opportunities. <laughs> and all of a sudden I realized, you know what, I need to just put all my busy work away and just attend to them here. And at first I said, oh, all right, so tell me, what are your names? And I just introduced myself and I said, so tell me how you met. And I'm just getting to know them, really friendly. And then I ask, what, what do you do? And they tell me what they did. And then, then they ask me, what do you do? <laughs> And all of a sudden that, you could tell, made them feel a little uncomfortable a little bit. But then I just kept smiling. And I just said, so what are you doing in Denver? What are you doing? And they were talking about that. And then finally, they make the announcement, the plane's getting ready to land. You only have 30 minutes left. And I go, I, I, want, I want this conversation to land somewhere. I want it to go somewhere. And so after having just being authentically interested in their life, trying to be as kind as I could, I just said, and this really got the conversation going. <laughs> I said, so can I ask you a question? Tell me. How do you feel about me being a Catholic theologian, given your lifestyle at all? How do you, how do you feel about that? <laughs> and they just got, all of a sudden, you could tell a little nervous, and they said, well, there's some Christians that don't really mind, and they just think whatever, you know, however you want to live life is fine. 
But then there's other Christians that judge us. And I could tell they're wondering, where do you stand? <laughs> and, and then they turned around and they asked the question back to me and they said, can we ask you, how do you feel about our lifestyle? Do we upset you? That was their question. Do we upset you? And then I just said, upset me. And I just smiled. I said, upset me. We've been having a, a fine conversation. I've enjoyed getting to know you. Now, I wanted them to know that I really legitimately, to use your point, truth and love, I wanted them to know I really loved them. Well, I mean, I really cared about them. Every person has dignity. Every person has made the image and likeness of God. We're called to respect that dignity, no matter what color, race, nation, or lifestyle, even if they disagree. But then I, I also wanted them to know truth. I didn't want it to just be, oh, I respect you. So I needed to come out and say something. So I said, we're going to disagree, I have a feeling, on your lifestyle and what the definition of marriage is, but I can still respect you as a person. And as soon as I, I just used that word respect, it just changed the look on their face. They immediately felt relaxed. They felt at ease. They smiled again. And it was like we we're back to the earlier part of the conversation. And then I just started asking, so, but I'd love to talk to you about this. So tell me, why do you think this is okay? You know, and then we started having a real debate. But it was a debate, as you said, Robert, in the context of a, a friendship, or I mean, I was just getting to know them, but there was a trust there. There was a trust that I wasn't coming in saying, you're going to hell, this is happening, this is happening, that I really was legitimately thinking, I think here's why I'm concerned about the change of the definition of marriage. And this is what I think it's gonna do for society, but honestly, this is what I think it will do for you. And then they were asking me questions, well, why can't we adopt children? And, and I said, well, let's talk about that. And I gave arguments, but all of a sudden, it was a whole different dynamic than in other times when I've just said, here's the three reasons why your lifestyle is wrong, and that just goes boom, it does nothing. And I think it's such a delicate balance when you say truth and love, because too often we'll just focus on a sugar-coated love that isn't really love, but it's just like, oh, you're okay, I'm okay, it doesn't matter. And we gotta be careful there. Real love, as I said, is to will the good of the other. And I wanna love people. And there's one beautiful quote from Pope Francis on this very topic that I think hits the balance right on the mark. Pope Francis once said, when it comes, and I'm just using this one issue of homosexual, people in homosexual lifestyles. We're called to love them, respect them, go out to them, accompany them, even pray with them. But here's the one line that never gets quoted in the media. And, Show them a better way. That's truth. Love, love them, accompany them, pray with them. But we've got to speak the truth and show them that the way they're living is not going to bring happiness. It's not good for them. It's not good for, their, the, for the culture. We have to show them a better way. It's a delicate piece, but you'll never get truth in if they don't know you really love them. Can I ask what you mean by, when you say Christians being attacked, are you talking about Christians in the Middle East and being uh, martyred and persecuted? Or do you mean more broadly, just like that Christians get mocked and we're not accepted? Correct. Well, we've been discussing about our way of life and being normal, and now it's being uh, pushed as being not normal because we're not accepting of the non-Christian way of life. And the leaders of our churches, they're not really coming out and defending our way of life. Hmm. Have any particular That's thoughts? Hard. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard question to answer. Um, and I'll just answer on the basis of what I do know. Uh, when it comes to the Vatican and Pope Francis, I know he's been very outspoken when it comes to defending uh, religious freedom and the rights of Christians in the Middle East and in countries where they're persecuted overtly. Um, you know, whether we saw that with Islamic extremism, etc., or the repression of Christians, um, their right to worship, etc. I'm going to be very honest and say I'm not aware of any explicit statements from 
Pope Francis or the Vatican with respect to what's happening in the Western world. Maybe Edward does, maybe some of you do, and please put those forward if you've heard that. I'm just saying I'm not personally aware of it. I'm not saying that I, there have been none. I think in the case of Australia, and looking at the situation that I know pretty acutely well here in Australia, there are individual bishops who certainly do speak out about it uh, quite clearly. And I, can, and I can mention, for example, uh, Archbishop Anthony absolutely on regular occasions has stood up for the right of Christians to be in, the, in public life, to speak out in the public forum and to be free from discrimination, etc. He was very proactive in the same-sex marriage debate. I'm Maronite background and I do know that my Maronite bishop Bishop Antoine Tarabé, who I used to work for when I was an AP, he was my principal. Uh, he's moved on to bigger and better things, he's now bishop. Um, he was very outspoken in favour of the traditional definition of marriage in that debate. Admittedly, there are some bishops who are silent, and there are some bishops who took the opposite side in that debate, uh, which I find to be regrettable. Um, now, yeah, so in Australia, I think it's a bit of a hit and miss proposition. I do know, for example, again, Archbishop Julian Portis in Tasmania has been a brilliant spokesman for uh, you know, advocating the Catholic Christian position in the public realm. I haven't heard anyone speak out recently, very recently, with respect to the Israel Folau issue in the Catholic Church. I know the Australian Christian lobby has come on board, full on board for, in defence of him and provided him a fundraising platform. I know the Sydney Anglicans came out in support of a brother Christian. I don't know, I can't say why precisely the Australian Catholic bishops haven't said anything, probably because they're all overseas right now on the ad limina with Pope Francis as a starting point, and maybe because Israel Folau is not Catholic and also he's made very strident anti-Catholic statements as well, Israel Folau. And as I said this to the men's talk, uh, that, you know, in that case, he, he's free to make those statements and we should be free and strong enough and courageous enough to actually engage him and, you know, debate him on those anti-Catholic statements. And, and the same with all his other statements and that he shouldn't be sacked from his job necessarily because of those statements. So that's, in all honesty, the global uh, amount of what I know. Maybe, Edward, if you could add to that with respect to maybe what Pope Francis has said, I'm not sure, but... Uh, yeah, I'll give you all the insider Vatican knowledge that I know, which is not much at all. But uh, I, what I can say is this, um, and, and I, I will say I've done a lot, I did a lot of reading early on on Pope Francis and his approach. And, you know, we can always question you know, what approach works best, you know, different popes, different personalities, different approaches. But at least it's helpful at least to understand. You know, one of the things that I would say I know that he has emphasized at the very beginning of his pontificate in some of his initial interviews and certainly in Joy of the Gospel, kind of his, his kind of foundational uh, apostolic exhortation, was the idea of uh, we want to be the, the field hospital for the secular world, uh, that the church needs to be there to help people who have, in, in a culture that's turned away from God and from traditional values, there are a lot of people that are deeply wounded and we need to go and bring healing and comfort and compassion to those who are suffering, whether they're suffering from great poverty or suffering from broken homes and suffering from abuse and other things. So in their secular world where there's, it's not just like you turn away from God and then everything's just normal. You know, you turn away from God and people's lives get ruined. You embrace moral relativism and people get hurt. Uh, and so Pope Francis has written about that. He actually has a line, something along those lines of relativism hurts people. <laughs> uh, and so the image of the field hospital is very important to him. But at the, at the flip side of it, he's also made statements about how, you know what we need to do in this period is just really focus just on the core gospel message, the heart of the gospel. And so it's not that as if he never talks about abortion or never mentions the problem of contraception and other things. It's just that he says, you know, to, in our secular world, we're, we're, that's what the Catholic Church is known for. Am I right? Like, if you were to go, I, I, I asked this question in the United States, and I would bet it's a little different here, but maybe similar. If you were just to go up to people and ask the average Australian, you just go into a coffee house, you go into the supermarket, and you interview them, what does the Catholic Church teach? What does it stand for? What are, what's the average person going to say? 
Okay, this church is known for scandal. That's true. That, that's a big thing in the U.S. It's a big thing here. But what about, what does the church stand for? What does it teach? No, what's the average person in the supermarket going to say? The church is against abortion. The church is against homosexuality. The church is against the transgender people. Isn't that what they're going to say? Am I, am I right? Is that, that, that's what they'd say in the United States. How many people, if you walk up in the supermarket, what does the Catholic Church stand for? They're going to say, they're going to stand for the God who is love. They're going to stand for the God who loves us so much, he, he came down and died for us. And he loves us so much that even though we turn away from him in sin, he's always there to forgive us. He gives us grace in the sacraments to help us overcome our weakness. He helps us care for those in need. How many people are going to say that? Like, nobody, right? And so there is an element in Pope Francis that I think he's on to something. And again, I'm not trying to explain everything about Pope Francis, but I, but I, I think it's helpful to understand this aspect of he wants to draw attention to the heart of the gospel. And he makes a point that we, we should, you know, we don't have, I remember in one interview, at first I was scandalized by it. He kind of said, well, we don't have to talk about abortion and contraception all the time. And at first I thought he meant we don't have to talk about it. But he said all the time. And as I read more, I, I saw what he was saying. And he actually was saying something Pope Benedict himself had said. Pope Benedict said, you know, when we do interviews, German bishops, back he was talking in the 1990s, when we do interviews all the time, and we keep talking about women's ordination and abortion and contraception, that's what the media just picks up on, and that's, how, that's what comes to define us. But the Catholic gospel is so much bigger than those things. Now, both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, they're not saying that we shouldn't talk about these things at all. They're not saying that those things aren't important and, and we should be willing to die for those truths. And quite frankly, as the culture gets worse and worse, some of us might be called to lay down our lives for those truths. But yet, those truths are not at the very heart of the gospel message. They're, they're related to it. And again, that's why we have to stand up for it. But the, what we want to be more known for in the secular, in other words, if you want to win souls, you don't walk up into the grocery store, I want to win you to Jesus Christ. Let's talk about contraception. And that's not like the lead off topic, right? Or let's talk about people infallibility, you know? No, no, we have to do first proclamation, the kerygma, which is the initial proclamation of the gospel, the initial kind of summary of the story of God and his love for us. And that actually is what moves people. I will tell you, that one of the talks we, we did up with, in the mountains with the, with the many college university students that were there is, was simply a talk about God's amazing love for you, no matter how many mistakes you've made, how many sins you've committed, how awful you feel about your life, whatever addictions you have, how beloved you are in the eyes of God. And the, many of these university students, they went into small groups and there were tears there were so many people that came up to me and they were just saying, I'm so thankful for hearing that message of how lovable I am because I felt my life was a mess and that I'm just not, I'm not loved by my parents, I'm not loved by my teachers, I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't find love with my friends and to hear this message of God's love and I'm like, it's just God's love, what's the big deal? Can we get to some more interesting topics? But in our culture today, some of the most fundamental truths is what's gonna captivate people's hearts and attention and if they can understand that core gospel message of the, the, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ for us out of love, then they'll be more open to understanding things like papal infallibility or why marriage is between a man and a woman and contraception and these other more things that have been very confused in our day. And, and, and so I think that that might help shed some light on maybe Pope Francis's emphases on talking about certain things and maybe why you don't hear him talk as much about other things. He still talks about them, but maybe not as much as, as maybe previous popes did. Uh, but it's his approach of wanting to meet the secular world and try to win them. That, that would be a positive interpretation of what he's trying to do. And we're trying to bring them up with Catholic uh, values and morals. And we send them to a Catholic school so that they are in an environment which is supporting what we're doing at home, uh, being the primary educators of faith for our children. But what I'm finding more and more, and we've struggled with in the last few years, especially with the marriage debate and things like that that have come up in the last few years, is that it's not necessarily a safe environment because our children are persecuted by most of the students in their class 
uh, topics that come up in the class, especially religion, if they're speaking about abortion and euthanasia, it is not necessarily addressed by the teachers in a very clear manner. So when they were speaking about the um, safe zones around the abortion clinics, it wasn't really supported by the, the uh, teachers in the class. There was one topic and my daughter stood up and spoke out against it. Um, the rest of the class were for it and said that, you know, the usual women shouldn't be abused and what have you, it's their choice. But there was no follow-up. So how do we help our children if we're trying to do this and they're supposedly in a safe space? Is it that we are not putting too much emphasis on youth because that's a really important um, place to evangelise? But how do we do this when their parents aren't evangelised? I think you've nailed it, you've described it very accurately. My position, and I'm head of a new evangelisation in Sydney Catholic Schools, and there's 152 schools in that system, and I am in senior leadership, and my role primarily is faith formation of teachers. And to be very honest, I think you've painted a very accurate picture there for what, for the most part, is the problem. I'm not going to pretend here. Okay, if I was to say something different, I wouldn't be honest, and you'd know I, would, I wasn't being honest. It's a matter of conscience between you and your husband what to do with your kids in the future. From my own experience, um, a lot of my friends are homeschoolers. My wife and I are not. When I married my wife, she made it very clear that she couldn't do and she wasn't interested in homeschooling. I felt safe because I was a school teacher at St. Charles College at Punchbowl and I've been there for 15 years and I ran the religious education in that school and I thought it's not a, not a problem because I'd have my kids there and they're going to learn the faith properly. Things didn't turn out that way. Before my, even my first child started at that school, I was driven out by a very evil principal. I, I don't mince words here, that's not overstating it. The religious order threw him out in record time because he was bad and went back to the Archdiocese to work. I could not come back to my school. But eventually, I put my kids in, into a systemic primary school, and it's not an overly bad scenario there. It's, the big problems are not in the primary space, K to six. The big problems are in the secondary space. I was going to have my boys now go to St. Charles in secondary school and I felt comfortable again because the RE department is still run by my friends and it's still very strong. The culture is good, it's not perfect, but it's very supportive of those issues that you raised. If you want to be a Catholic and say, put the Catholic position in that school. Eventually my boys wanted out and, and they forced the issue and I couldn't control the situation and my wife supported them, etc. and they went to a, system, a, 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 a systemic uh, secondary school in the Archdiocese. I wasn't entirely happy with that, but for the sake of family unity, I went with it. But my boys were now in a position where they were aware, they're street aware. They knew what the faith was, and they knew the problems in the new school they were going to. And after four years, I can thankfully say, thanks God, being in that school did an impact on them. But all the issues that you've mentioned were in that school as well. When they are very young, every morning I drive them to school and I say a certain prayer, and part of the prayer is this, not to learn bad words, bad behaviour or false teachings at school. I made them aware that they're going to go into an environment where they will be challenged. And my sons were told that, you know, I can't believe that people as intelligent like you can believe in God from other students. Okay, these debates were happening. You have to work out whether you've fortified your children strong enough to survive that environment. Some can, some cannot. Okay? That's, I can't answer that question for you. I can't recommend or not recommend homeschooling. That's a question between you and your husband and see if it's possible. If it's not possible, then it's not possible. Then you have to make them aware that what you're hearing in the school is not right and trust mum and dad. We practice the faith, we have the faith and this is the faith and, and you've got to hear bad words and see bad behaviour and hear false teachings from teachers, be aware, okay? You need to do that to preempt what they're going to hear. I'm not giving up on the school system. I'm up of a certain age now. I think I've got about 10 to 15 years left in me and I'm dedicating myself to this 
work and I've noted, I think I've met, I've met many hundreds of good people in these schools. Trust me, there are faithful people. Some of them are here today. Okay. A handful, but some of them are here today. I'd say 300 people I know in schools are good. I've got a list in my diary of 70 young teachers. Definition of young is under 35 that I recognise that I need to be aware of and to encourage, support, give them confidence, self-belief and to seek, go up the ladder of leadership. And so we can, you know, eventually have a RECs, APs, principals who are faithful people. Most people in schools are sheep, they're followers. They do what they're told. They think this is Catholicism, this is how they were trained at school, at university, in teachers' college, in their prac. And that's, that's, what, that's what they see around them in the staff room, everywhere. They, they think what is normal is right, but they don't know what is right. And we have to show them a new normal. And if we had leadership showing them a new normal, you know, some of them would follow. Okay, we have an Archbishop who has a very clear vision of what he wants in his school. We have a new Executive Director who's in line with that vision and implementing it. And a lot of scared people at the moment with our new Executive Director. I'm happy. Okay, he's shaking things up. He's very faithful. Uh, you know, I haven't tested him out on every issue, but he seems to be on board. I work for a great boss as my director. We've made, he's made many changes over the last dozen years. Things are better than where they were a dozen years ago. But they're not where they should be. And they're not going to get there in my lifetime. I'll be dead and buried before we get there, if we ever get there. But we have to nurture that next generation. We have to nurture the next generation to be professionals, to be qualified, to get the degrees on top of their faith that they have. I'm pretty confident in myself. People have taken me on where I am at the work because I'm six foot five and a quarter. It's 198 centimetres and 200 centimetres with my shoes on and I'm a big lad from Bankstown and I have a deep voice. People are scared of me. And when some people have taken me on, they've regretted it. Okay, uh, and I'm not easily intimidated by these people, and I thank God for that. Um, there are a lot of nasty people, there's a lot of good-willed people. It's a battle, it's like fighting guerrilla warfare in a, in a city that's in ruins. Again, only you can answer that question, whether you fortified your kids to be, part in the, to be among the rubble in this warfare. All right? I'll say we've done the whole gamut. We've homeschooled, we've sent kids in Catholic schools, we've had kids in public schools, and it's always like where we are in the season of life and with our family. But I, I would echo everything that Robert just said there. One other piece I would add on is whatever situation your kids are in, even if it's like the best of Catholic schools or if it's a mixed experience at Catholic schools, how important it is to do what you can to ensure your children have good friends so that they don't feel so alone. If there's any way, like even at your parish, like so maybe at their particular school, there's no one there, <coughs> then maybe you find some other families here at the parish that have kids around your age and you're getting them together, you're intentionally doing this. So I'm gonna tell you two scenarios. In my just, I'm, I've got three kids in the teenage age right now. So I've got one, uh, well, one is just graduating high school off to university, one is going to be uh, the junior, we call it junior year, uh, and then one starting high school this year. So I'm right in the midst of this, and I will say I had my, my one daughter who was at a kind of more public school setting, but it was a public school that had a lot of good Christians, a lot of good Catholics at it. And it was a little more classical in its educational approach, and so that's why we sent her there. But as the years went on, the school was getting less and less classical, more and more secular, and, but she still had a good group of friends that were there and it helped her through it. But then in the last, her last year, the other good Catholic families that were there left and she was alone. And so it was really, really hard for her this year. Uh, and she just didn't have any friend support and she's hearing all this goofy liberal stuff. She knows it's not true, but she just didn't have friends she could share her faith with at the school. And we tried to you know, help her connect with her friends that weren't at the school still, and she had that to support her, but she's so <laughs> thrilled to be going to a wonderful Catholic university next year. She just can't wait to get there. Uh, and so, but it, I'm just saying it was really hard. On the flip side, my, I had a, my, my son, two years ago, when he first went to a Catholic high school in our, in our town, that's, it's, it's not the best of Catholic high schools. They do have a classical track, 
And within this track, there are a lot of good families that have sent their kids to do these like three classes throughout the day, every day. So half of his classes are really good, and then the other half are mixed bag. And, it's the, it's, and I'm not worried about the classes, it's more the culture in the school. It, it tends to, again, a lot of foul language, a lot of talk about things they shouldn't be talking about, and uh, drugs and other things. So it's kind of, it's dicey, I'll be honest. But I'll tell you one thing I did that very, in that first, even before school started, I just called some of these other Catholic families. I didn't know who they were. I mean, I, knew, I maybe met them once or twice. I didn't know them well, but I called them and said, hey, let's do a big barbecue. And I was intentionally trying to get to know the other families and get a sense, what other families are on the same page with me on how I would want to raise my kids? And I started getting to know them. And then it was, hey, let's do this again. Let's get the boys together another time. And then eventually I pitched the idea of, hey, what if we have the boys get together and do a Bible study or do a, a small group? And then, and what happened was, and there was a lot of me and another dad being really intentional, trying to find other dads, that now there's this small group of guys, about six or seven guys, and they meet every other week. They meet for a, like a scripture study, and then they're in classes together, and they, it just helps them. They're not alone. And, and they call themselves the God Squad now. <laughs> they have their, their own name, and they'll sometimes get up early and go to mass together. But it was, it was some of us dads intentionally trying to connect the kids together and start something. What I shared with the students up in the mountains, it was another one of these things I said, you know, you need other friends. When you make a barbecue, you take all the charcoal, right? And what do you do with the charcoal? You pile them all together. That's how you make a great barbecue. But what happens if you take one of the charcoals and you put it way over here? If it's isolated, the heat's going to die out. The flame is going to go away. And so what we need to do for our kids, whatever situation it is, whether you're homeschooling, the best of Catholic schools, or mixed bag Catholic schools, whatever it is, try to make sure they find other burning coals with them as best you can. What's happening in Australia? There's some vote about this? What's going on? Well, having what's called a plenary council, which is, okay. uh, you, know, you know, the synodal version of church synods. Yes, okay. The plenary council is of a higher order canonically because right. actually the, it has a, they can vote and they can have a binding impact legislatively on the whole church in Australia. But the people who vote are the bishops and certain heads of religious orders, not the laity. But this has been a long process and there's been tens of thousands of submissions by laity and a lot of the submissions are a great concern, like asking the church to be more open to same-sex marriage, to be more open to female priesthood and diaconate, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Look, I'll give a very simple answer because most people who ask that question, not a condition to hear a long-winded answer or understand a technical answer. The church does what Jesus did with all the sacraments. The church only can do what Jesus did. When we go to mass, it's bread and wine. Why? Because Jesus used bread and wine in the first mass. You can't use cake and cordial, okay? When you baptize, it has to be with water and the word in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Confirmation involves the oil, okay? When you, uh, what's another? When you have the sacrament of penance, the priest has to say the words of absolution, I absolve it. There is certain matter and form. Jesus only called men to the ministerial priesthood. He called married men and he called single men. When they married, okay, when they were called a celibate, they remained celibate. When they were married, he called them as... Uh, um, as married men, and in the early church, very early centuries, they didn't have, they didn't engage in sexual relations after they were called to the priesthood. That changed a few centuries later. But simple as that, the church can't ordain women to the ministry of priesthood because Jesus never called them in the first place. The church is bound to what Jesus did. It's for fidelity to what Jesus did. That's the simple answer. 
But Jesus was constrained by his culture, and it was a patriarchal culture, and that's why he had to choose men. If he came at a different time, he would have chose women. That's what some people would say, but that's not true. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to debate. You want to debate? I'll debate you. <laughs> I just want you to know that's where the argument would go, right? But, but I would argue, and this is just very clear from the biblical studies, there are countless times where Jesus goes against the cultural norms of his day, right? I mean, how many times he's eating with sinners and tax collectors and the Pharisees get all mad at that. He wasn't constrained by any means. He, he is the Holy Son of God. He's coming in. He's also coming in the fullness of time. He chose men for a reason. So I, I, I would want to actually I'll, I'll build off everything here that, and say I think there's, there's a sacramental vision of the universe that helps even just make sense out of this. You know, so it is true. We're only doing what Jesus said. We're only doing what Jesus did. I want you to know that John Paul II, Pope Benedict affirmed this. Pope Francis himself has affirmed that there's not going to be a woman priesthood. So I, I'm, I'm new here, so I'm, I'm from Australia. I don't know why we would be voting on that if the current Holy Father has already even just, out, just said that that's never going to happen. Now, that, that being said, let's go further. The why. Uh, there's a whole sacramental symbolism that is written into creation that you find in sacred scripture, that you know, God is a father, God is, he's, he's, not, he's beyond masculinity and femininity, all masculinity and femininity resides in God, right? We're all made in the image and likeness of God, and yet in the way in which God relates to us, there's something beautiful about how in the Old Testament, he is not only called the father, but he's also called the husband, and Israel is called the bride. They're married at Mount Sinai, uh, and they have this beautiful relationship. It's like their honeymoon in the 40 years in the desert. And then when Israel's faithful, she's the pure, spotless bride in the Old Testament. But when she's unfaithful, breaks the covenant, uh, worships other deities, it's like she's cheating on God. There's this marital imagery that's there. And when Jesus comes, this Holy Son of God came and became a man. That wasn't just random. That wasn't just because of the sociological conditions of that age. No, it was actually to make a point also that God is coming and he's seeking us out and he's coming to lay down his life for us as, a, uh, as Jesus does, laying down his life for his bride, for the church. And the sacramental symbolism, um, without getting too explicit here on camera and everything and little children around, but you can see the idea of, of, of God as a bridegroom coming. Jesus is a bridegroom coming. He's coming to give birth to, this, to the people of God through his church. And so it, it's, it's just, it doesn't fit the sacramental symbolism of the universe if God came down and became a woman and did all this. Like there is, there's something intentional in the way God has revealed himself to us. Uh, there's a wonderful little book, uh, well, a couple books I'd recommend. I don't know if they have these here in Australia. Would people be familiar with Thomas Howard? He's written a wonderful book mm -hmm. called Chance or the Dance, which talks about some of these ideas. Not, it's not about the women priesthood. Maybe one little book I might recommend is by Peter Kreeft. He's written a small little book. It was published by Franciscan University Press called Women in the Priesthood. And it would help give a little more even background into that understanding of why it makes sense. Uh, okay, so... Anyway, I'm sure you're for <laughs> Just one small addition. Um, what Edward said about you know, cultural norms and Jesus being bound by cultural norms. In short, the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood um, in you know, Judea and in ancient Israel was all male. But if Jesus was founding, in a sense, let's use loose language here, a new religion, one that would have been intent, intending to be a universal religion that is beyond the confines of ancient Israel to go, to, you know, spread throughout the European, uh, Med Mediterranean, you know, North African, European world, then he wouldn't have been, have, he would not have been founding something unusual because all the non-Jewish, all the pagan religions that had a priesthood had female priests. You know, the pantheon of the Greek, Roman gods, etc. Those religions that had priesthood and, and offered sacrifice had female priestesses. So it would not have been hard, and Jesus wouldn't have been out of would not have been out of the ordinary to have found to have found a new international religion that would have included women, would have had a female priesthood. So Jesus was doing something deliberate, um, and, and as the Son of God, a divine person, certainly not being restricted to, you know, according to the social norms of that time. 
What I'm really concerned about this push for female priesthood is it really about being obedient to God's will? Is it really being about being, being faithful to Jesus Christ? Or, or is it really about a power grab? Because when John Paul II wrote against the uh, ordination of women to the ministerial of priesthood in May 1994, he said the most important thing for us as Catholics, as Christians, male or female, is to seek sainthood, sanctity, not power. Okay, so this is what we, another aspect of this debate that concerns me. It seems like a, just a raw power grab.